Let's welcome her, Adrienne Brett Rajamy. So good afternoon, everybody. Thanks a lot for this nice introduction and for inviting me. And as you heard, I'm coming a little bit more from the quantitative side, from <clears throat> environmental sciences. And I have been always fascinated by the more normative dimension, the artistic, the creative part of landscape design. And I've been working for the last 10 years in trying a little bit to link both. But as you know, with marriage, it's not always easy when both things get together and they merge and they get one. So I was trying a little bit more to keep both sides explicit and to try to find out what are the important qualities of the one side, the land system science side, the more quantitative side, and what are the qualities of the other side? And how can we bring both qualities together to get something new out of it? And especially to develop, as we said and heard, some solutions which are local, which are legitimate, which are salient. And this is especially a big issue when we look at what's going on. These are déjà vus for many of you. And when I flew in here, I thought, hmm, it looks the same here as well. This is called the McDonaldization or Ikeaization of the landscape. And it usually happens where the very specific urban landscape with the rural landscape, they blend into a new landscape which doesn't have the qualities of the urban, neither has the quality of the rural area. And it's usually also characterized by some problems, social problems, but also health problems. A lot of people have obesity problems because they commute with the cars. And it's also related to a lot of environmental problems because it eats up the best land. And most of you, they know something about landscape. And we think about landscape as a key determinant of the tie between the environment and the people. So this change is changing this tie. It's changing how people interact with the landscape, how they feel home, how they make place, how they get attached to the place. And so understanding how these globalization can be integrated in the process of making place becomes really important when we look at the scale of what is going on. These are just data we gathered very, uh, a few weeks ago. And you see very nicely, it's a very interesting data set. It's a data set you see from before Christus. So very long time ago, it's the Haida database. And you see how the population density has changed in blue and in green, you see the tropical and temperate change. And you see how the temperature, so the people in temperate area here are here, and how this has caught up. And you see that the development going on is mostly in rural areas. So this peri-urban area is really changing what we see, not in the urban, the urbans are what they are. But we have a new kind of densification, new cities. We don't think of them as cities, but they are new cities, also from their densities outside the urban areas we're thinking about. It is kind of a little bit a vicious circle, where we have these globalization processes, what we saw before, which impact the diversity. As we've seen, it looks all the same. And this negatively impacts the attachment to the place, how people get attached to the place, and finally, placemaking. So the question is, can we reverse this vicious circle? How can we break this vicious circle? And I have a little bit of hypothesis, and it sounds pretty um, easy, and probably for you when you hear it, it's oh, normal. But the global factors here, we cannot change them. We cannot influence directly you today. You cannot change as a landscape planner or designer. You're not going to change the global factors. So 
you react to the global factor, you act, you integrate them in your planning. Let's say you have built a house along a coast and it's probably you had a nice view until the first storm came in, then water is uh, getting higher up and then your house gets destroyed and you might, obviously, you might move your house in the back. So you adapt to a certain situation. So you have <coughs> integrated these global processes here in this system to make attachment. So maybe this is wrong, what we say that this EKization or marginalization of the landscape is happening. Maybe globalization processes are fostering a kind of an adaptation to these uh, situations. So my question is, how can we include these global drivers? And how can we understand how these globalized drivers impact the local placemaking? Do we understand this? And how can we understand this better? Land system science has been a science, and a few of you are coming from this um, part, has been a science which has worked a lot on trying to understand how these global process, climate change and socioeconomic change, influence land use. On the other hand, landscape design has been interested in understanding how the landscape configuration is valued, socially valued by people. And I'm going today in this whatever, 40 minutes or 35 minutes, I'm going to expand a little bit the, the, the solution space with five paradoxes. And they are anchored in each of the discipline. And as I said with marriage, I don't want to mix them up, but I'm going to show you with five case studies how the link between these methodological, these concepts, these ideas, can cross-pollinate the other part to provide some new emergent solution for getting, for integrating these global factors in some local placemaking. So before doing this, uh, maybe some of you are not from the land system science community, so I'm very, very shortly going to say what, what I understand under that. And <clears throat> for example, if you look at here, this is a slide by Turner, a PNAS uh, publication, but it's a huge community, and especially the Global Land Project, maybe you have heard about it, it's part of Future Earth. There's a big community which works on trying to understand land use change. And they're trying to look at global factors, local factors, how they influence land use change. And land use is not just only considered just as you know, forests, grassland, or, or urban area. But the land system science community tries to understand that there is a social part, and there's an ecological part, and there's a socioeconomic process which plays together. And increasingly, they use the term ecosystem services to characterize how, what comes out of the system, and to try to understand how can we change the drivers so that the services provided by the environment are the services people demand. So ecosystem services is an important link for them to communicate between changes in the potential of the vegetation, etc., to produce some services which are demanded by society. If we look at what happened then in the last years in landscape design, we see that Landscape design has not forgotten totally or lived a word apart, but there's some important publication. This is one of Joanne, which was very important for me in my whole work, which showed very nicely that the landscape design can be framed by science, can be informed by what the science finds out to produce some more credible landscape design. So already here, you see that an iterative loop here can help produce some more uh, some patterns, some landscape patterns, which can scientifically be informed by information, knowledge, models, etc. So if we extend this by really understanding what has been happening in the last you know, 10 years in land system science, I believe today that maybe I can show you a little bit better how these global factors and how what has been learned 
in this other discipline, how this can be used in design to get some new solution, really to be able to integrate these global factors, etc., in this local plan. So let me begin with the first parallel. And I'm sure you've heard about it in many other places, but space is not equal place. The land system science has a lot focused on space. They have tried to understand with different sensors how the space is, how it works, what are the rules. For example, ecology, what are the rules, why do certain species need certain areas. And they have used a lot of sensors, be it from the sky or be it just uh, attached to animal, for example, to understand how the space functions. And I'm going in each of these um, five uh, paradox always illustrate with one topic. And the first topic is urban heat island, as you see. And if I look at land system science here, a publication on urban heat island, you see the outcome of what they have produced. You see Beijing, and you see that they have analyzed how urban heat island changes during the day and night, and they've seen, okay, well, the urban heat island, the heat doesn't get out of the city at night, you know, and you see here that this is all the reflection of the heat during the night. So they have tried to understand how the heat is distributed over day and night. The designer on, its, on his side, he has designed certain places without understanding, is this green here really effective? Is this green changing the wind or the turbulences? Is this green here changing the humidity and maybe the local climate change? So there's a big discrepancy between how these two different disciplines think about landscapes, how they address the problem. So the first example is how could we link these two different ways of thinking? And I'm going to bring you as a first case study to Abu Dhabi, to Mastar. And that was one of the very first projects I worked on. We were asked to design the center of Mastar. Where's my phone? I think it doesn't make sense. Ah, no, here we go. So here, the center of Mastar. It's um, quite small. This whole area is about 12 hectares, and the whole area is 6.4 uh, uh, square kilometers. And we were asked to create the master plan. And one of the big problems in Masdar is, of course, climate. And as I said, we cannot change climate. We need to adapt. So we try to find rules on how green area and the pattern of the urban can help to increase the urban, you know, the thermal comfort of the city. So we went into the literature on ecology trying to find out what are the rules, the ecological rules, which would help us with the patterns. We looked at the plants. What are the plant traits necessary to adapt to the climate? And we created many rules for many different ecosystem services. So all the plants were characterized in terms of how much water they were taking, how much they would cost, and how much they would evaporate and what would be their effect on the climate. And this was linked into small models. Here also we look at the habitats, etc. And we encoded this all in a grammar, in a language. And this grammar was then encoded here and linked to a 3D visualization <coughs> of the outcome, which was then used here as a product for the designer to negotiate what they wanted to have as a future product. And you <clears throat> see here how this works. This is a language. This is a new grammar where the rules for this were introduced here to create some designs, which on one hand you know, were maybe good for water usage or for cooling effect or for cost. We also had some other points. And depending on the design, we could just switch the rules deciding what is going to happen. So we included some kind of knowledge from landscape ecology, codified it, 
to inform the design and to have a negotiation about this information. The second paradox is about the scale. And in land system science in the last year, we have a lot, we have been talking a lot about telecoupling. Telecoupling means that what we do here is linked to many processes and many landscapes at other places. So it's not just the product of here, but let's say, for example, we have, we are, um, you know, we're selling some products here, the price is going to be dependent on how the prices are changing in another country. We're working, for example, in Madagascar, where we're looking at the changes in club production. Club production is extremely dependent on what's going to happen in Indonesia. So if you have a hurricane there and everything is, uh, is destroyed, the price is going to change. So the landscapes, how they react to the environment at one place, impact the landscape at other places. So we're not isolated here, and we're very dependent on how these different landscapes in the world are connected. So this is a work uh, by one of the pioneers of this concept, Liu, and he showed very nicely how a very isolated nature conservancy area in south uh, west China, the Wolong Nature Reserve, which has one of the biggest population of these grand, beautiful uh, panda bears, um, is linked to all over the world. So they, they export pandas and many tourists come to their place. So there is a big exchange just because of the panda, which is linked to many other processes. The pandas bring money and this money leads to more information around the world. And the agricultural production is going to change because when they get more money, they're going to produce less agricultural products. But now they have money and they can import fertilizer and the final product is the environment in this nature reserve is not doing well. Because this whole thing, this whole loops are changing how this nature reserve is working now, which has much more problem in the environment than before. So we need to understand, this is just an example, how we need to understand how the scales play with each other. And this is a typical, uh, this is, typical for land system science to really try to understand how these things are linked together. So how can we include this understanding of scale when we design? Let me take you back to an urban area. And this is Zurich. It's a part of Zurich. And you see here the strategic plan. It's a directive plan. It's binding for the population, or for the planners. And you see here some land use zones and you see here just concentrate on the red zone the habitation and the orange zone and as you know in european city the goal is really please densify please develop in the city no no sprawling in switzerland we cannot do any sprawling anymore we have some contingent etc so no sprawling anymore but you know with our green areas and the landscape we lose our jobs there's no green areas anymore so that's what's happening. So you see here 2020, if you look back, you see here everything becomes red and the green area disappear. Okay? So if we look at the recreation, that's the recreation in now. Yellow means low recreation. That's where we don't have a lot of green areas. Recreation is here defined as eight square meter per person, which is used as the uh, area uh, it, it's kind of a, it, it, uh, it's a boundary which is given by, by the municipality. So they have to have eight square meter per person. Four people just uh, using it over lunch, for example. So people just working in a 200 and 300 meter distance. But also for recreation over the weekend where they have higher distance. And when it means high, it means that the capacity of the green area is big enough for all the people going there. So it's not just the supply, but also how many people live around it, okay? Because you won't go to an area if there is, it's like totally crowded, you might not really recreate there. It's not very nice. So when we look at the um, plan in 2020, we see, oops, we have a big change in the situation, the recreational <coughs> situation. But if we zoom in, and this is what the Canton knows, so this is at the largest scale that what he knows, but when we zoom in, 
We might, with design, change this situation a lot. This is what the architect gets. He gets the whole plot, as shown before. He gets this whole plot to develop. He's not going to get a very detailed plan. And if he gets this whole plot, this architect is doing this, this is doing this, and this red area here, you see, is really low in terms of recreation. If we, are, however, give the architect only this part, and we tell him to densify on this part, the recreation is much better in terms of quantity for the people living here. And we can even build higher and put more people with having a larger area for these people. So again, if we consider just, if we don't consider the different scales, the designer is going to be stuck into just working with a very small scale, a plot, trying to design something, a process, which has a totally different scale. So planning means really going over scale and understanding the process at the different scale. And just here, this area then was secured also by the, um, the municipality and was bought by the municipality to have just the development on these areas. The next point is about prediction and negotiation. In, land, in uh, landscape design, you don't do a lot of simulation, prediction in the future. You usually just design the current situation. Maybe you do some scenarios, but you don't predict. Land system science has done a lot of prediction. They are very interested in trying to understand the past, how it changed, and then to put some pressure and pulses on the systems and see how this changes. <laughs> let look, let bring you to Switzerland, where I come from, <clears throat> and let's look first at the land use change. These are the land use changes in all the mountainous area in the world. And the big problem is, of course, climate change. Mountains are a little bit like early warning systems because they, are very, they have very steep vertical gradients. And here you see the temperature change here. It's a very nice paper. You see how the temperature in the summer, in be between 2,000 and 2,500 meters, can change up to 5 degrees until 2,099. So we have a very sensitive system. And we also have a very sensitive system in terms of the economy. There are marginals area where the people are leaving out of the area and what happens is that the forest area is encroaching people are not managing it anymore we lose all the cultural landscapes and we see here we have an increase in urban areas some tourists coming and we have a loss of texture area so <clears throat> the land system science community begins to think well so how is this system resilient to climate change and to socioeconomic change. So what we did is we created a so-called agent-based model. Agents are typologies of people which have certain rules and they act in the environment. So they're like, you know, all of us are like little people and they do certain things in the environment. And this system then functions as it has functioned until now. And then we put this system under many, many pressures, under global scenarios, shocks, and then we do some interventions, like you would do in design. So we look how these interventions here, how can they modify the big pressures? Can they? Let's, do, let's say you would design a park. How much is your park going to absorb the big shocks? Can it absorb it or not? So that's one way to do it. And to know if the, the goal of what we wanted to do is what the people wanted, because we want this normative dimension I discussed, the, the one of the landscape design, we asked people. We didn't just do a survey, but we did a so-called choice experiment, an economic experiment, which, for example, is used to design how bottles are designed. So you ask people, do you like a red lid or a black lid? And people say, I prefer red, and then etc. So they describe until we find out how the utility is best of this bottle. 
So that's what we did. We asked people what they liked best here in this landscape, the housing, or if they wanted more ecologically producing agriculture places, more flowers, etc. And not interesting kind of, uh, the results are kind of obvious. We saw they hate the biz they hate all the urbanization, they don't like it, you know, <laughs> they don't like this encroachment, they don't like to lose their cultural landscapes, and um, they don't care so much about the flowers. It's okay, it's green, it's fine. So we said, okay, so now under these changes, can we get to this future that people have visioned, to what they would like to have? And unfortunately, so this is the utility, and we see that the, the scale begins at zero, and it only goes down. So under all these pressures, our system in Swiss mountains has no chance to absorb these shocks. And all these little things you see here up there are interventions. The interventions we are trying to do, they don't really like help. If you look at, this is just coloring all these runs, but if you look at here, you see that under this growth and convergence, this is a global scenario, that's the one at the moment we have, is the one which has a liberalization of the market and also a strong climate change. We see that we have a really decrease in the utility. So all these negative things are just increased. If we look at the things we could change up here, we see that these interventions are very necessary just to keep it nearly zero. So we need to close a market and to give money to these people to stay there. Without that, we have very, very big change in the landscape. We can get to another system, maybe that's fine, but that was the system the people, the normative system they uh, formulated. So translated it to maybe your work in landscape design is try to understand how these interventions you're producing, can they help us to really buffer this big change. But another very, very useful uh, characteristic of such system is to try out to find what then exactly are all, what happens in this socio-ecological system here? What are the characteristics, the principle necessary to be up here? And what was very interesting, and that's what she said what we are going to publish in a few weeks, I don't know how fast it goes, but it's in the pipeline. What we saw very nicely is that the actor's diversity, which is the diversity of all the people working there with their management capa capabilities, their skills, is very important. It's as important as the diversity of the plants. You've heard that it's important to have many, many diverse, uh, many diverse uh, environments to be able to absorb shocks. And it's exactly the same in a socio-ecological system. We need to have a very, very diverse social uh, system with a lot of different capabilities and skills. And if we lose them, we will never be able to get to that point. So supporting a certain diversity, even if it costs something, and maybe it's not very economically relevant, is key to be able to absorb this. So when we think about design, we also have to think about that. We need to have with our design different people and <clears throat> address different people with our designs to be able to absorb the chunks. Let me come to the fourth point about <clears throat> the approaches. In land system science, landscape is taken as an object. It's something just, you know, you're trying to see how it changes and you modify it. In landscape design, landscape is more taken as a medium, as something where you have stakeholders interacting. And that is important, for example, when you think about energy landscapes. I'm sure you have heard about all these discussions and also uh, in the United States, it's very, very difficult to get these things in the landscapes. You see these things? In Switzerland, they're even more difficult. <laughs> so it's very difficult to get these things. Because people say at the beginning, yes, sure, we need to, I mean, in Switzerland, we decided to get out of um, uh, nuclear energy, so we signed it, so until 2050, no nuclear energy anymore, 
we're just going to import it from the other people, but we don't say that. <laughs> but we need to build 5,000 of these. Switzerland is small. We need to build 5,000 windmills. So the state asks us, well, can you find out what we need to do to make them accepted? We said, well, it's going to be difficult because on one hand, people cognitively think, yes, it's important to, you know, to have renewable energy, but they don't want it. They are afraid, they feel bad. So um, we decided to find out in uh, experiments what are the tipping points in the different landscape to support these kind of landscapes, so mix of renewable energy. So it's not just only windmills, etc. So what are the tipping points in the different landscapes for these energy? And uh, we didn't just work with just um, surveys trying to understand how the land use is and what the people think about it, but we went a step further and said, okay, well, how do people feel? So now this is the lab I'm working in. It's a small lab and it's a lab I'm working with landscape architect. So I'm an engineer and I'm working with landscape architect together. And so we create these acoustic um, visual simulation, and we put people here, and we measure them. We measure their skin conductance, how they sweat. We measure, measure if they're unhappy. And on the other hand, we do big surveys. So we nest the big surveys here into these, because we have less people we can ask. It takes an hour, so we cannot ask 700 people in here, so we nest this this survey into a big survey we would ask the whole uh, community. And what was interesting to find out is that people cognitively, they have preferences for landscape, depending where they come from. Maybe you come from Michigan, or maybe you come from Denver, Colorado, maybe you don't like Michigan, and you would be able to say, I prefer the Denver, Colorado than the Michigan, I prefer it. What was interesting, and they say that, so they say they prefer certain landscapes. What they don't say is that they don't like the amount of renewable energy. So what they say, they say, yes, we like renewable energy, but as soon as you change the amount of renewable energy, their physiological factor says, no, 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 you're lying. So interestingly here, there's many of these global processes we filter. And the thing is, this normative, when you do landscape design, comes out then afterwards because people say, no, don't do this. I don't want this. I want something different. But it comes very late in the process, too late to have a strategic plan. So we really need to understand here how can we, how do these cognitive factors evolve? How do they happen? And how do they influence these more emotional factors which are linked to the design, to the patterns you can see in the landscape. Let me come to the last uh, point about simulation and design. I'm bringing you back to a very highly urbanized area uh, in Jakarta, in Asia. And uh, <coughs> I'm going to concentrate on the Chilihong River. It goes here into the Java Sea, and it's an extremely populated area. And the Chilimu River is one of the most <coughs> polluted rivers in the world. And it's also the home, or many, many people live here in informal settlement just around the river. And we were asked uh, by uh, the public work, to the water public work, to develop a design for this area. And of course, this is not a problem just for this area, but if you look at what's happening in the whole area here, we see that we had a doubling of the urban areas at the cost of many paddy rice areas, which are uh, in the flat area. <coughs> and we also had, if you see here, a loss of dry rice paddy and here an increase in the dry land agriculture at the cost of forest. So we have many land use change which have a direct effect on the design down here. 
So just doing design down here is not going to help because what is happening up here in the catchment area is going to have a huge impact on what is happening down here in the area. So we decided to do simulation at three different scales. One here, the catchment scale. I'm going to go into details of each loop. The corridor scale and the side scale. And this is key because just a solution at one scale has no effect on what you really want to have. Maybe what I forgot to say here is that the services provided here are, for example, people not just use the water for drinking, but they bath in it, and also the culture service, and they take food out of it. And the people up here, there are conservation areas, there's big production of wood, and agriculture production. So they both have, they're kind of linked in terms of their land use, even if they're very, very far apart. So the first thing is what we did is to develop in a very iterative process with the people plans about land use at the upper scale. Land use plan, how can we change the land use? What is possible to get a certain amount of water in that river? So we run big models under different land use scenarios to understand the discharge of water, also under climate change and other socioeconomic change. So we saw how much can we steer, you know, opening the valve in the catchment area just with a land use plan. We went then one step further down and looked at what can we do in the corridor. And we worked here with point clouds, LIDAR data. I heard that I had to pronounce this very correctly. My English is not perfect, so hopefully you understand. LIDAR are um, scanner data, which this is a point. This is not a picture, but this is a point in three dimension. And it can be modified. It can be modified. The topology can be modified by people. And it can be used not only by the architect or by the designer and the planner, but also by the hydrologist. So the hydrologist used exactly the same data as the planner. And iteratively, we worked, because this is a huge intervention in the landscape. So iteratively, we worked, how much can we tune this landscape to make it better for downstream? At the end, we needed to decrease the amount of flood downstream. So we had decreased it a little bit upstream with the land use plan. Now we tuned the landscape, the topology. And finally, and we looked how does this influence the flood and the contaminant simulation, also with the hydrological model. And then we went to the site and asked people, so again, we did these choice experiments and asked people, so what kind of landscape do you want? Do you want it like in um, Singapore, just a culvert and an access road? Or would you like to be able to work, you know, to walk along it? Do you want to live? What happens with the people living there, etc.? So we had a big discussion and also a choice experiment there to identify what they wanted. And the product here is what you can see here. So you see here again these data set we acquired. There's no data, so we did these terrestrial laser scanner uh, analysis. And this is a model which is milled in 3D. We didn't have to displace any people. The project is being implemented at the moment. But this is the final product. We did this for six years. For six years, we did the iterative loop at three different scales to try finally here. And you cannot do this with the current technologies, just in terms of the old technologies where you would create every time a new map. This is just printed. This is 3D printed or milled with a point cloud. And you can add the trees. And you can do this many, many different times. And giving this information to the hydrologist again to inform how, it, how good this is for the services the people have expressed in the survey. So do we get again to these services, to the normative dimension? And here you see also these trees, etc. We worked a lot with all kinds of, of trees. We had 21 trees we added to the landscape, removed, etc. Discussed what kind of trees would support a certain type of flooding during a certain time. And finally also we developed not just only 
pictures, but really a 3D model where we projected what is going on here as a material also, like you would have in a planning, uh, you know, in a planning office to discuss with the people around some physical model. So this was the first time I have to say with my colleague Christoph, the architect, that we could communicate with the same language. It was the first time we worked on exactly the same material. Until now, we always, he sent me some sketches and I told him, I don't understand your sketch. Why did you do it like this? He said, oh, this is like this. And so I remodeled it in GIS or something. Then I, I showed it to him and said, no, it's ugly. The colors are not good. And we always had for hours discussions. And that was the first time for these, uh, the project that we could talk the same language. We could talk a language where we could model, we had information in 3D uh, manner, which he could modify, he modified the colors of the points, and I could get an interpretation of it, and I could use it for understanding what is going on in the system. So to understand how the system functions, what are the services provided by the system, what are the plans, what kind of plan, what do the plans do, etc. So I was wondering if maybe this could be a new grammar. And you see here again uh, one of these uh, point clouds. This is not a picture. These are all point clouds. And you see in the back that we added houses. This is Singapore. And these are point clouds. We can modify. We added, you will see at the end, an entire neighborhood. We can change it. We can add trees. We can discuss it. And we can inform. What we used it for here it's in Singapore is to assess urban heat island. I'm coming back to my first slide. To really understand what is the urban heat island in these areas and <clears throat> to model it. So you can see here the new part. You can see the old part. And you can see how we can work with it. However, it's not that easy, I have to say. At the end, it's the question, what is this point? So this scanner shows point in space. So these are, this, this is a scanner, for example. You can also fly. We have a drone, and we are kind of geeks. We're engineers, of course, so we like all these machines. So we have points in space, but the problem is that they're stupid, these points. They are not going to tell you what they are. So you need to find algorithms to extract what they are. And this is not that easy. It's not that easy to have the algorithm tell you this is a tree. <laughs> or this is a house. It's very difficult. So at the moment for our urban heat island to try, so we do different designs with point clouds and we assess how the design works in terms of urban heat island. We cannot do that directly. We have to do some kind of a loop here and we have to transform <coughs> all the stuff in mesh still. So we need here some good people working with artificial intelligence. We are working very closely now with a colleague to really get us these point clouds into objects we can use. And I believe that, again, this is, again, a fantastic way to understand objects, get new grammatics, also grammars for the landscape design. What is the element you want to add in the landscape? How should it look like? What are the colors? There's many definitions now, concepts coming back just because we use a new technology. So for me, just bringing these two things together to create something new is probably also developing a new strategy. And I think bringing these sciences together and really interacting together in an interdisciplinary manner is key to really get novel insights and to be able to add the value to these changes. With the changes we saw at the very beginning, this uniformization, we need this normative dimension, but we need to work together. We need to understand space place, we need to understand the effect of scale and also the effect of time. Uh, so spatial scale and temporal scale. I also believe that there's a lot of new technologies and approaches developed in land system science, as you saw, simulations which can be used or, for example, also some uh, technical devices which can be used, sensors, which can really help also for the design. And finally, I think it's worse to test these new languages 
I'm pretty sure that we can learn a lot about each other, get to communicate with each other, and get a new model to work uh, together, to enable together to transform these places and to develop legitimate, salient, and also credible landscapes for the future.